are some things that you look for when you first start working with a director? You know, you always hear about like the director, or producer, get picked the cinematographer. Mm. But for yourself, is there anything that you're looking for the director in terms of collaborability or at least personality that, you know, OK, this is someone that I want to work with or is it project specifically? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I do think there is a component of that that's really important. Uh, that's something I learned maybe the hard way, but it's definitely worth it in the long run to really think about when you're interviewing for a, for a movie, especially short form content. This is less important because of the time frame, but for a movie, it's, it's a big time commitment and you really want to make sure that you are, I mean, you're basically entering a relationship with somebody for a finite period of time. And, uh, you need to make sure that that relationship is going to be healthy and discern that in the interview process. Like you are going in and interviewing for a film, but at the same time, you're also interviewing the director, producer, the film itself and interrogating whether or not it would be a right fit for you in a, in addition to the, the, the other way around. Right. So I do think it's really important to be aware of that and, and picky and, and conscious um, Mercedes and I had the benefit of, um, meeting up well before this film was a reality. So by the time the movie came around, we already knew that we got along because what your language was like, exactly. And at the, at the fundamental level, it's like, am I going to be able to get along with this person for 12 hours a day, every day for three, four, eight, nine months, like however long it is. And that's, that's really the most important thing is, um, are we compatible as, as, as people, like just on a base level, right? And then the next level beyond that is, are we creatively compatible? Like, do we share similar tastes and interests? It doesn't mean you're always going to like the same movies, but at the very least, there's like a baseline of a mutual understanding of film language and what, what you like about it, what you don't like and what just a, just a initial taste alignment, I think is, is pretty sure. important. Right. And then beyond that is, is the specific project a, a good fit for your interests and sensibilities. Uh, and in this case, um, this film ticked all three boxes. It was, it was really a no brainer and I needed something to do during the pandemic. <laughs> so it was like work was, work was pretty slow, uh, that summer when things started coming back into production started coming back and online in like July, June, July, August, 2020. And I was like still playing animal crossing, <laughs> waiting for the <laughs> phone to ring. And, and then yeah, in July I got the call for this feature and I was like, Oh, thank God I have something to do this year. That's uh, amazing. Yeah. Well, it was really great for the film also because none of us had done anything for months. So we were all like, yes, a project, something to sink our teeth into and focus on and spend time on. So I think the film really benefited from that sort of extra runway and extra um, mm -hmm. brain power and just a desire to like make something. So, yeah. And when you guys went into production, obviously you spent some time collaboratively talking over the script. What was the goal with the film? Was there something that you both said, all right, this is how we want it to look Mm. This is from the directorial perspective, but also yourself. Was there something that you're mutually trying to achieve? Yeah. M Mercedes was super prepared um, in a way that I hadn't really encountered before um, up until the, the most recent film that I did, uh, which uh, our director was even more prepared than Mercedes somehow. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> he'd been thinking about the project for four years. That's that's why. But um, Mercedes just came in with such strong ideas. And actually, um, I, sh I should loop this into my answer before about what, I'm, what I look for in a director. Uh, somebody with a specific vision and really specific ideas can really make or break this type of experience. Because th as a DP, like there's a reason I didn't pursue directing. And it's... At, in middle school and high school, I sort of was like, I had a best friend and I, and we would make all of our films together and we were sort of co-directors, but I was always doing camera and he was always doing like talking to the actors and basically he was directing and I was shooting it, but we didn't really see it that way at first. Um, 
for me, cinematography is collaboration. Like that is the most important component of it as a, as a position. Uh, and going to NYU, I think I was really faced with this fact that like, I don't, I'm not a director. Like I do not have the wherewithal to just sit down and like come up with my own ideas. Uh, and, but what I'm really good at is going down like a creative tangent, riffing off of somebody else's initial thoughts or ideas. So like getting ideas from a script, getting ideas from a director that has already put something down on paper, Mm -hmm. like put together a shot list or put together some references or something. That's something I can work off of. And that fires up, like I need something to feed the creative engine or else it doesn't, it doesn't fire up. And Mercedes was just constantly feeding it, like just full of crazy ideas uh, in the best way possible, like really creative shots. And we wanted the film to be really dynamic and immersive and entertaining and creative um, and fun. And, uh, and as a DP, yeah. sorry to like, oh yeah, go ahead. Get cut in with that type of feedback. Do you? Because Shane always talks about this. He was like, for me, someone once told me being a great DP is like giving your opinion even on the script, whether that necessarily means like those changes are enacted or not. Do you find yourself doing that too? Being someone that bounces off, like, oh, like, what are your thoughts with this? This could really help with the cinematography. Yeah. Do you think that's important for the DP to like give that opinion? I do. I, I think. I think at the end of the day, it's really easy to compartmentalize ourselves and to put everybody, uh, including ourselves as GPs, in a little box and say, okay, well, this is my purview and this is my goal is to um, make the lighting consistent or achieve a certain aesthetic or um, anything like that. For me, it goes back to that initial epiphany that I had uh, about commercials was like, the most important thing is to make something holistically good. And the cinematography is part of that, but it has to work in concert with the rest of the film. It has to work in concert with the production design and the costume design and the makeup um, on the production side. It has to work in concert with the editing on the post side. And it has to work in concert with the script and the story and the acting and the directorial vision. It all has to work together. So like for me, the job of the DP on the one hand, yes, is to figure out those technical questions like, oh, we want to do this specific thing. How do we do it? Or um, we shot this scene at a certain time of day in January, and now we have to shoot a pickup in May for that scene, and it has to match. The lighting has to match. So like, those, are, that, those technical challenges are, are a big part of it, for sure. But the bigger picture is that we're all, every department head and every um, crew member and every actor and every person involved in the film is making the film, like the best movie Mm -hmm. possible. And also as like someone who just likes movies, that's I think a big motivator for me is like I just wanna make things that I would then go see in the movie theater and like enjoy, right? So I do think whatever in whatever capacity we have. Um, It's important for the DP to be a partner in the making of the project and not just uh, showing up and doing the technical stuff. And and sometimes that happens, like sometimes, I I get it, and you can't always choose those projects or you can't always choose those collaborators or you're not always presented with the opportunity to to be put in that position and people have, bills and mortgages and all sorts of considerations to, to, to take into account uh, that might affect putting yourself in that kind of situation. But for me, at least, and the choices that I make, that is a huge motivating factor is can I make something good? Can I make a good film? Right. Yeah. Oh, I think that's really well put. And how did that translate going back to my initial question? How did that translate into your no, vision? <laughs> yeah. I just for, no, no, I where, no. I actually looped it off, so that was yeah, me. Yeah. Going back now, talking about what your intentions are and what you want to get out of it, working with Mercedes. What did that come to like become the vision for fixation? What What did you both want to have happen in that film? Yeah, I mean, I think we wanted to create something that had a really specific edge and personality to it that was distinct to 
the uh, the film and correlated to the to the experience of the main character, mm-hmm. which is. I think something that that can seem a little obvious when stated, because I do think in general that the best cinematography is subjective and and character driven. But in this case, because uh, she goes through this kind of wacky Alice in Wonderland-esque experience, um, we wanted to make sure that the audience was going through that experience as well. So that dictated every creative decision in... um, from lensing to the way we moved the camera to um, the way the sets were designed and the costumes mm-hmm. and how it all worked together and how it was lit, everything. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the technical. What were the tools that you used? And also, how do you, in your creative process, pick those tools? Yeah, the, it's a great question with an interesting answer in this in this case because um, we found ourselves on this project. It was a f- relatively low-budget project compared to what we were trying to pull off. So it was... Uh, four point five million dollar budget, but it was the script of like a twenty million dollar budget movie or something. It was very ambitious. It was all like I mentioned, um, set builds. Uh, so we had to build everything up from scratch, light everything up from scratch. Like there's no location work, um, and we shot in nineteen days, which is a, a huge challenge for any film, much less like an ambitious one with all these different uh, moving elements. Um, so in that nexus, we found ourselves like caught between the creative ambitions and the financial realities, which I think is a common situation that people find themselves in. And I think the solution to that was we just felt that we had to be open to um, different tools that could get us what we needed. So we shot on Alexa Mini. We had two cameras for the whole for the run of show. We had this amazing uh, B camera op who was also our steady cam op named um, Julian Lamaga. The whole crew was Canadian. Bless them all um, for what they what we put them through. Um, and uh, lens wise, this is where we had to get a little creative because it was a little tricky to find the exact lenses that we wanted. And uh, all we knew was there were sort of two planes of reality in in the film one that is intended to feel very grounded and neutral, and then one that's intended to feel kind of elevated and stylized. So our initial concept there was we would shoot the grounded elements spherical and the elevated elements anamorphic. They would lend it sort of this extra level of cinematic flair that correlates to the character kind of going down this fanciful, like untethered from reality experience. But the specific lenses became a little tricky because um, it was just hard to nail it down. Like we were going to go through Panavision and then when the pandemic um, productions kind of opened up, uh, every film and TV show started shooting in Toronto at the same time. So there were over 100 productions happening at the same time. And many of them were like big Netflix shows. So our, our poor little indie was like, well, you're not you're not gonna get Panavision Anamorphic. Like, sorry, we just don't have him. So uh, we ended up shooting on Hawk V Light Anamorphics, and the spherical's we shot on the Vantage One spherical's, which are also made by Vantage, which makes the Hawk lenses. Um, and I had never worked with those before, but we knew we wanted a fast lens. We wanted to throw the backgrounds really out of focus for those sequences to um, create just really shallow depth of field shots that focused on the the main character, Dora. And so that's, that was our mandate. It was like, we just need a fast lens. Uh, And one thing led to another and we, we ended up with the, the, the vantage ones. Did you like the way that the vantage, did you like uh, like the image that they rendered? It's pretty fascinating. So the the whole lens set is a T1 throughout all of the focal lengths. Uh, Now, some of them perform better at a T1 than others. Some of them you kind of have to stop down a little to a 1.2 or something to make them, like, resolve. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Some of them are quite, like, blurry and um, halated, wide open. And then sometimes we use those flaws to our advantage and, like, use them intentionally for a shot. And sometimes we would just stop it down a little bit. But... Overall, yeah, I was super impressed. They're like really um, great close focus, sharp, um, once stopped down a little bit. And just, yeah, really, really great. Mm -hmm. Fuzzy on the edges, like really great 
roll off, but they're modern lenses. They're not, um, they're not old vintage, like rehouse vintage lenses. So, uh, it was really cool. And I think they dovetailed well with the, um, the Hawks, the Hawk V lights. And out of the whole Hawk lineup, why did you go with the V lights? Was it for steady cam use or just availability? Yeah. Availability. <laughs> Same answer as yeah. The, the previous thing, it was sort of like, what anamorphics can we yeah. get our hands on? Uh, but yeah, they are very good for steady cam and I've used them before. They're, um, they're kind of, they're just great kind of jack of all trade anamorphics, really mm -hmm. great for, um, studio mode, steady cam, very, um, flexible, um, versatile. Yeah. Lovely. And just <laughs> to hop around, I know that you and Julia Swain, amazing cinematographer yeah. as uh, well. She's also Julia. a friend. Shout out to Julia. Yes, uh, Julia. You both have been doing those collaborative <laughs> posts on Instagram yeah. also with old fast glass, which I love old fast glass. Oh, I used to rent from them and get their B speeds all the time. Yeah. And, uh, but I know that you've been going through their whole lens selection, which their lens selection is rather extensive. What are you trying to achieve by that? And obviously all cinematographers, guys love playing with lenses yep. <laughs> and the goal is to learn as much, but is there anything that you've been learning as you're going through these older lenses and shooting with modern lenses, old lenses? What do you feel like it's given you as a filmmaker in terms of education? Yeah, uh, it's funny. It, it feels like a true Sisyphean task to go through the entire old fast glass inventory because every time I go in for a test, and shoot on everything they have. I go home and then a day later. Yeah, something new. Yeah, they post on Instagram, <laughs> like, just got these new lenses. And I'm like, oh man, I gotta go back. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Mark and the whole team over there do. And he has a setup now because I used to yeah. rent when it was just out of his house. Oh yeah, they have a beautiful setup. Their mm -hmm. space is incredible and they have they have uh, other rental houses, take note please. They have a um, a whole lens test area that's, kind of like this office, beautifully lit, curated, uh, looks great as a backdrop for lens tests. Um, it's like in a loft uh, above their rental space and just a really welcoming uh, space that's really conducive to testing and looks nice and uh, very smart branding too because everyone, all the lens tests from there look the same because they all have the same background. So very smart on their part. Um, I see you, Mark. Uh, well done. <laughs> uh, but um yeah, uh, the main takeaway from any time I go there is just that we are so lucky as DPs nowadays and have so many amazing options uh, at our disposal. Um, many of, I mean, it's almost too much. At some point, there's like, uh, it's an abundance of of riches. Really, uh, I think the the biggest takeaway though, and the biggest revelation for me over the past couple of years. And actually, um, Greg Fraser turned me on to this as well with his use of the um, uh, iron glass adapters and the vintage lens. Um, Alan, shout out to Alan, amazing guy. Um, their rehoused um, uh, stills lenses uh, that they shot on the Batman. Um, super cheap. Um, Were they like Russian, the Helios? The Helios, yeah. yeah. And there's a few others. There's a Noctilux and a... a J J Jupiter or something. Anyway, it's a, it's a variety of old Soviet glass, stills glass from the 70s that these guys in Ukraine in the midst of a war have been rehousing and chipping out. Uh, and they're, they're just super cheap. I mean, they're like, these are lenses that they probably sold tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of them, like just off the shelf, pro, not even prosumer, just like consumer grade glass in the 70s now rehoused and recontextualized for cinema opens up this whole world of like just beautiful portraiture lenses with amazing astigmatism and fall off. And there's so many sets like it. So in addition to the Soviet lenses, there are um, uh, Nikons and Nikors and obviously Leica glass. Um, Minolta has, the, the Old Fest Glass have this amazing rehoused set of Minolta stills lenses. Um, from the 70s or 60s, uh, and they're just stunning. And uh, Canon rangefinder lenses, like all, th there's so many great options. And the thing is, they're they're cheap. Like these are not um, this. Not to knock the need or use um, case for like high end precision cinema grade glass, but 
I think it, there, there's just such an opportunity to lend um, character to our images. And it goes back to this taste thing of like what's, what separates you as a DP and what is your unique perspective on, the, on how you see the world. Like this is one way that people can find to express that, that kind of perspective is through um, glass and how the, their glass choice and their taste in lenses like mm-hmm. renders the world around them. And just the idea that you can take like your, you know, grandfather's like basic cheap Minolta 35 millimeter point and shoot lens from the seventies, rehouse it in this beautiful housing and throw it on a, a Venice or Alexa LF or whatever it is, or FX three or black magic or whatever, and get um, just the most beautiful, like rich, incredible imagery is really exciting mm-hmm. to me. Um, and uh, just a great, yeah, it's just a great opportunity for expression and creativity. And there's so many good options out there. So many. 